Section 5 of The Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche Third Essay What is the Meaning of Ascetic Ideals? Part 1 Careless, mocking, forceful, so does wisdom wish us. She is a woman, and never loves anyone but a warrior. Thus spake Zarathustra. 1. What is the meaning of ascetic ideals? In artists, nothing, or too much. In philosophers and scholars, a kind of flair and instinct for the conditions most favorable to advanced intellectualism. In women, at best an additional seductive fascination, a little morbidezza on the fine piece of flesh, the angelhood of a fat, pretty animal. In physiological failures and whiners, and the majority of mortals, an attempt to pose as too good for this world, a holy form of debauchery, their chief weapon in the battle with lingering pain and ennui. In priests, the actual priestly faith, their best engine of power, and also the supreme authority for power. In saints, finally, a pretext for hibernation, their novissima gloria cupido, their peace in nothingness, God, their form of madness. But in the very fact that the ascetic ideal has meant so much to man lies expressed the fundamental feature of man's will, his horror vacui. He needs a goal, and he will sooner will nothingness than not will at all. Am I not understood? Have I not been understood? Certainly not, sir. Well, let us begin at the beginning. 2. What is the meaning of ascetic ideals? or to take an individual case in regard to which I have often been consulted. What is the meaning, for example, of an artist like Richard Wagner paying homage to chastity in his old age? He had always done so, of course, in a certain sense, but it was not till quite the end that he did so in an ascetic sense. What is the meaning of this change of attitude, this radical revolution in his attitude, for that was what it was. Wagner veered thereby straight round into his own opposite. What is the meaning of an artist veering round into his own opposite? At this point, granted that we do not mind stopping a little over this question, we immediately call to mind the best, strongest, gayest, and boldest period that there perhaps ever was in Wagner's life. That was the period when he was genuinely and deeply occupied by the idea of Luther's wedding. Who knows what chance is responsible for our now having the Meister singers instead of this wedding music, and how much in the latter is perhaps just an echo of the former. But there is no doubt but that theme would have dealt with the praise of chastity. And certainly it would have also have dealt with the praise of sensuality, and even so it would seem quite in order, and even so it would have been equally Wagnerian. For there is no necessary antithesis between chastity and sensuality. Every good marriage, every authentic, heartfelt love transcends this antithesis. Wagner would, it seems to me, have done well to have brought this pleasing reality home once again to his Germans, by means of a bold and graceful Luther comedy. For there were and are among the Germans many revilers of sensuality, and perhaps Luther's greatest merit lies just in the fact of his having had the courage of his sensuality. It used to be called, prettily enough, evangelistic freedom. But even in those cases where that antithesis between chastity and sensuality does exist, there has fortunately been for some time no necessity for it to be in any way a tragic antithesis. This should at any rate be the case with all beings who are sound in mind and body, who are far from reckoning their delicate balance between animal and angel, as being on the face of it one of the principles opposed to existence. The most subtle and brilliant spirits, such as Goethe, such as Hafetz, have ever seen in this a further charm of life. Such conflicts actually allure one to life. On the other hand, it is only too clear that when once these ruined swine are reduced to worshipping chastity, and there are such swine, they only see and worship in it the antithesis to themselves, the antithesis to ruined swine. Oh, what a tragic grunting and eagerness. You can just think of it. They worship that painful and superfluous contrast which Richard Wagner in his latter days undoubtedly wished to set to music and to place on the stage. For what purpose, forsooth, as we may reasonably ask? What did the swine matter to him? 
what do they matter to us? 3. At this point it is impossible to beg the further question of what he really had to do with that manly, ah, uh, so unmanly, country bumpkin, that poor devil and natural Parsifal, whom he eventually made a Catholic by such fraudulent devices. What? Was this Parsifal really meant seriously? One might be tempted to suppose the contrary, even to wish it, that the Wagnerian Parsifal was meant joyously, like a concluding play of a trilogy or satiric drama, in which Wagner the tragedian wished to take farewell of us, of himself, above all of tragedy, and to do so in a manner that should be quite fitting and worthy, that is, with an excess of the most extreme and flippant parody of the tragic itself, of the ghastly earthly seriousness of earthly woe of old, a parody of that most crude phase in the unnaturalness of the ascetic ideal that had at length been overcome. That, as I have said, would have been quite worthy of a great tragedian, who, like every artist, first attains the supreme pinnacle of his greatness when he can look down into himself and his art, when he can laugh at himself. Is Wagner's Parsifal his secret laugh of superiority over himself? the triumph of that supreme artistic freedom and artistic transcendency which he had at length attained? We might, I repeat, wish it were so, for what can Parsifal taken seriously amount to? Is it really necessary to see in it, according to an expression once used against me, the product of an insane hate of knowledge, mind, and flesh? A curse on flesh and spirit in one breath of hate? An apostasy and reversion to the morbid Christian and obscurantist ideals? And finally, a self-negation and self-elimination on the part of an artist, who till then had devoted all the strength of his will to the contrary, namely the highest artistic expression of soul and body, and not only his art, of his life as well. Just remember with what enthusiasm Wagner followed in the footsteps of Feuerbach. Feuerbach's motto of healthy sensuality rang in the ears of Wagner during the 30s and 40s of the century, as it did in the ears of many Germans. They dubbed themselves young Germans, like the word of redemption. Did he eventually change his mind on the subject? For it seems at any rate that he eventually wished to change his teaching on that subject. And not only is that the case with the Parsifal trumpets on the stage, in the melancholy, cramped, and embarrassed lucubrations of his later years, there are a hundred places in which there are manifestations of a secret will and wish a despondent, uncertain, unavowed will to preach actual retrogression, conversion, Christianity, medievalism, and to say to his disciples, all is vanity, seek salvation elsewhere, even the blood of the Redeemer is once invoked. 4. Let me speak out my mind in a case like this, which has many painful elements, and it is a typical case. It is certainly best to separate an artist from his work so completely that he cannot be taken as seriously as his work. He is, after all, merely the presupposition of his work, the womb, the soil, in certain cases the dung and manure, on which and out of which it grows, and consequently in most cases something that must be forgotten if the work itself is to be enjoyed. The insight into the origin of the work is a matter for psychologists and vivisectors, but never either in the present or the future for the aesthetes, the artists. The author and creator of Parsifal was as little spared the necessity of sinking and living himself into the terrible depths and foundations of medieval soul contrasts, the necessity of a malignant abstraction from all intellectual elevation, severity, and discipline, the necessity of a kind of mental perversity, if the reader will pardon me such a word, as little as a pregnant woman is spared the horrors and marvels of pregnancy, which, I, as I have said, must be forgotten if the child is to be enjoyed. We must guard ourselves against the confusion into which an artist would fall only too easily, to employ the English terminology, out of psychological contiguity, as though the artist himself actually were the object which he is able to represent, imagine, and express. In point of fact, the position is that even if he conceived he were such an object, he would certainly not represent, conceive, express it. Homer would not have created an Achilles, nor Goethe a Faust, if Homer had been an Achilles, or if Goethe had been a Faust. A complete and perfect artist is to all eternity separated from the real, from the actual. On the other hand, it will be appreciated that he can at times get tired to the point of despair of this eternal unreality and falseness of his innermost being. 
and that he then sometimes attempts to trespass on to the most forbidden ground on reality and attempts to have real existence with what success the success will be guessed it is the typical velleity of the artist the same velleity to which wagner fell victim in his old age and for which he had to pay so dearly and so fatally he lost thereby his most valuable friends but after all quite apart from this velleity who would not wish emphatically for wagner's own sake that he had taken farewell of us and out of his art in a different manner not with a parsifal but in more victorious more self-confident more wagnerian style a style less misleading a style less ambiguous with regarding to his whole meaning less schopenhauerian less nihilistic five what then is the meaning of ascetic ideals in the case of an artist we are getting to understand their meaning nothing at all or so much that it is as good as nothing at all indeed what is the use of them our artists have for a long time past not taken up a sufficiently independent attitude either in the world or against it to warrant their valuations and the changes in these valuations exciting interest at all times that i have played the valet of some morality philosophy or religion quite apart from the fact that unfortunately they have often enough been the inordinately supple courtiers of their clients and patrons and the inquisitive toadies of the powers that are existing or even of the new powers to come to put it at its lowest they always need a rampart a support an already constituted authority artists never stand by themselves standing alone as opposed to their deepest instincts so for example did richard wagner take when the time had come the philosopher schopenhauer for his covering man in front for his rampart who would consider it even thinkable that he would have had the courage for an ascetic ideal without the support afforded him by the philosophy of schopenhauer without the authority of schopenhauer which dominated europe in the seventies this is without consideration of the question whether an artist without the milk of an orthodoxy would have been possible at all this brings us to the more serious question what is the meaning of a real philosopher paying homage to the aesthetic ideal a really self-dependent intellect like schopenhauer a man a knight with a glance of bronze who has the courage to be himself who knows how to stand alone without first waiting for men who cover him in front and the nods of his superiors let us now consider at once the remarkable attitude of schopenhauer towards art an attitude which has even a fascination for certain types for that is obviously the reason why richard wagner all at once went over to schopenhauer persuaded thereto as one knows by a poet her way went over so completely that there ensued the cleavage of a complete theoretic contradiction between his earlier and his later aesthetic faiths the earlier for example being expressed in opera and drama the later in the writings which he published from 1870 onwards in particular wagner from that time onwards and this is the volte face which alienates us the most had no scruples about changing his judgment concerning the value and position of music itself what did he care if up to that time he had made of music a means a medium a woman that in order to thrive needed an end a man that is the drama he suddenly realized that more could be affected by the novelty of the schopenhauerian theory in majorem musicae glorium that is to say by means of the sovereignty of music as schopenhauer understood it music abstracted from and opposed to all the other arts music as the independent art in itself not like the other arts affording reflections of the phenomenal world but rather the language of the will itself speaking straight out of the abyss as its most personal original and direct manifestation this extraordinary rise in the value of music a rise which seemed to grow out of the schopenhauerian philosophy was at once accompanied by an unprecedented rise in the estimation which the musician himself was held he became now an oracle a priest nay more than a priest a kind of mouthpiece for the intrinsic essence of things a telephone from the other world from henceforward he talked not only music did this ventriloquist of god he talked metaphysics what wonder that one day he eventually talked ascetic ideals six schopenhauer has made use of the kantian treatment of the aesthetic problem though he certainly did not regard it with kantian eyes kant thought that he showed honor to art when he favored and placed in the foreground those of the predicates of the beautiful 
which constitute the honor of knowledge, impersonality, and universality. This is not the place to discuss whether this was not a complete mistake. All that I wish to emphasize is that Kant, just like other philosophers, instead of envisaging the aesthetic problem from the standpoint of the experiences of the artist, the creator, has only considered art and beauty from the standpoint of the spectator, and has thereby imperceptibly imported the spectator himself into the idea of the beautiful. But if only the philosophers of the beautiful had sufficient knowledge of the spectator, knowledge of him as a great fact of personality, as a great experience, as a wealth of strong and most individual events, desires, surprises, and raptures in the sphere of beauty. But as I feared, the contrary was always the case. And so we get from our philosophers, from the very beginning, definitions on which the lack of a subtler personal experience squats like a fat worm of crass error, as it does on Kant's famous definition of the beautiful. That is beautiful, says Kant, which pleases without interesting. Without interesting. Compare this definition with this other one made by a real spectator and artist, by Stendhal, who once called the beautiful une promesse du bonheur. Here, at any rate, the one point which Kant makes prominent in the aesthetic position is repudiated and eliminated. Le désintéressement. Who is right, Kant or Stendhal? When forsooth our aesthetes never get tired of throwing into the scales in Kant's favor the fact that under the magic of beauty, men can look even naked female statues without interest, we can certainly laugh a little at their expense. In regard to this ticklish point, the experiences of artists are more interesting. And at any rate, Pygmalion was not necessarily an unesthetic man. Let us think all the better of the innocence of our aesthetes, reflected as it is in such arguments. Let us, for instance, count to Kant's honor the country parson naivete of his doctrine concerning the peculiar character of the sense of touch. And here we come back to Schopenhauer, who stood in much closer neighborhood to the arts than did Kant, and yet never escaped outside of the pale of that Kantian definition. How was that? The circumstance is marvelous enough. He interprets the expression without interest, in the most personal fashion, out of an experience which must, in his case, have been part and parcel of his regular routine. On few subjects does Schopenhauer speak with such certainty as on the working of aesthetic contemplation. He says of it that it simply counteracts sexual interest, like Lulupin and Kempfor. He never gets tired of glorifying this escape from the life will as the great advantage and utility of aesthetic state. In fact, one is tempted to ask if his fundamental conception of will and idea, the thought that there can only exist freedom from the will by means of idea, did not originate in a generalization from the sexual experience. In all questions concerning the Schopenhauerian philosophy, one should, by the by, never lose sight of the consideration that it is the conception of a youth of 26, so that it participates not only in what is peculiar to Schopenhauer's life, but in what is peculiar to that special period in his life. Let us listen, for instance, to one of the most expressive among the countless passages which he has written in honor of the aesthetic state. World is Will and Idea, Book 1, page 231. Let us listen to the tone, the suffering, the happiness, the gratitude with which such words are uttered. This is the painless state which Epicurus praised as the highest good, and as the state of the gods. We are during that moment freed from the vile pressure of the will. We celebrate the Sabbath of the will's hard labor. The wheel of Ixion stands still. What vehemence of language! What images of anguish and protracted revulsion! How almost pathological is that temporal antithesis between that moment and everything else? The wheel of Ixion, the horrid labor of the will, the vile pressure of the will. But granted that Schopenhauer was a hundred times right for himself personally, how does that help our insight into the nature of the beautiful? Schopenhauer has described one effect of the beautiful, the calming of the will. But is this effect really normal? As has been mentioned, Stendhal, an equally sensual but more happily constituted nature than Schopenhauer, gives prominence to another effect of the beautiful. The beautiful promises happiness. To him it is just the excitement of the will, the interest, by the beauty that seems the essential fact. And does not Schopenhauer ultimately lay himself open to that objection? That he is quite wrong in regarding himself as a Kantian on this point? That he has absolutely failed to understand in a Kantian sense the Kantian definition of the beautiful? That this beautiful pleased him as well by meaning of an interest, by means in fact of the strongest and most personal interest of all, that of the victim of torture who escapes from his torture? 
and to come back again to our first question what is the meaning of a philosopher paying homage to ascetic ideals we get now at any rate a first hint he wishes to escape from a torture seven let us beware of making dismal faces at the word torture there is certainly in this case enough to deduct enough to discount there is even something to laugh at for we must certainly not underestimate the fact that schopenhauer who in practice treated sexuality as a personal enemy including its tool woman that instrumentum diaboli needed enemies to keep him in a good humor that he loved grim bitter blackish green words that he raged for the sake of raging out of passion that he would have grown ill would have become a pessimist for he was not a pessimist however much he wished to be without his enemies without hegel woman sensuality and the whole will for existence keeping on without them schopenhauer would not have kept on that is a safe wager he would have run away but his enemies held him fast his enemies always enticed him back again to his existence his wrath was just as theirs was to the ancient cynics his balm his recreation his recompense his remedium against disgust his happiness so much with regard to what is most personal in the case of schopenhauer on the other hand there is still much which is typical in him and only now we have come back to our problem it is an accepted and indisputable fact so long as there are philosophers in the world and wherever philosophers have existed from india to england to take the opposite poles of philosophic ability that there exists a real irritation and rancor on the part of philosophers towards sensuality schopenhauer is merely the most eloquent and if one has the ear for it also the most fascinating and enchanting outburst there similarly exists a real philosophic bias and affection for the whole ascetic ideal there should be no illusions on this score both these feelings as has been said belong to the type if a philosopher lacks both of them then he is you may be certain of it never anything but a pseudo what does that mean for this state of affairs must first be interpreted in itself it stands there stupid to all eternity like any thing in itself every animal including la bête philosophe strives instinctively after an optimum of favorable conditions under which he can let his whole strength have his play and achieves his maximum consciousness of power with equal instinctiveness and with a fine perceptive flair which is superior to any reason every animal shudders mortally at every kind of disturbance and hindrance which obstructs or could obstruct his way to that optimum it is not his way to happiness of which i am talking but his way to power to action the most powerful action and in point of fact in many cases his way to unhappiness similarly the philosopher shudders mortally at marriage together with all that could persuade him to it marriage is a fatal hindrance on the way to the optimum up to the present what great philosophers have been married heraclitus plato descartes spinoza leibniz kant schopenhauer they were not married and further one cannot imagine them as married a married philosopher belongs to comedy that is my rule as for that exception of a socrates the malicious socrates married himself it seems ironic just to prove this very rule every philosopher would say as buddha said when the birth of a son was announced to him rahula has been born to me a fetter has been forged for me rahula means here a little demon there must come an hour of reflection to every free spirit granted that he had previously an hour of thoughtlessness just as one came once to the same buddha narrowly cramped he reflected is the life of the house it is the place of uncleanness freedom is found in leaving the house because he thought like this he left the house so many bridges to independence are shown in the ascetic ideal that the philosopher cannot refrain from exultation and clapping of hands when he hears the history of all those resolute ones who on one day uttered a nay to all servitude and went into some desert even granting that they were only strong asses and the absolute opposite of strong minds what then does the ascetic ideal mean in a philosopher this is my answer it will have been guessed long ago when he sees this ideal the philosopher smiles because he sees therein an optimum of the conditions of the highest and boldest intellectuality he does not deny existence 
he rather affirms thereby his existence and only his existence, and this perhaps to the point of not being far off the blasphemous wish, periat mundus, fiat philosophia, fiat philosophus, fiam. 8. These philosophers, you see, are by no means uncorrupted witnesses and judges of the value of the ascetic ideal. They think of themselves, what is the saint to them, they think of that which to them personally is most indispensable, of freedom from compulsion, disturbance, noise, freedom from business, duties, cares, of a clean hand, of the dance, spring, and flight of thoughts, of good air, rare, clean, free, dry, as is the air on the heights, in which every animal creature becomes more intellectual and gains wings. They think of peace in every cellar, all the hounds neatly chained, no baying of enmity and uncouth rancor, no remorse of wounded ambition, quiet and submissive internal organs, busy as mills but unnoticed, the heart alien, transcendent, future posthumous. To summarize, they mean by the ascetic ideal the joyous asceticism of a deified and newly fledged animal, sweeping over life rather than resting. We know what are the three great catchwords of the ascetic ideal poverty, humility, chastity. And now just look closely at the life of all the great fruitful inventive spirits. You will always find again and again these three qualities up to a certain extent. Not for a minute, as is self-evident, as though perchance they were part of their virtues. What has this type of man to do with virtues? But as the most essential and natural conditions of their best existence, their finest fruitfulness. In this connection, it is quite possible that their predominant intellectualism had first to curb an unruly and irritable pride, or an insolent sensualism, or that it had all its work cut out to maintain its wish for the desert, against perhaps an inclination to luxury and dilettantism, or similarly against an extravagant liberality of heart and hand. But their intellect did affect all this, simply because it was the dominant instinct, which carried through its orders in the case of all the other instincts. It affects it still. If it ceased to do so, it would simply not be dominant. But there is not one iota of virtue in all this. Further, the desert of which I just spoke, in which the strong, independent, and well-equipped spirits retreat into their hermitage. Oh, how different is it from the cultured class's dream of a desert. In certain cases, in fact, the cultured classes themselves are the desert, and it is certain that all the actors of the intellect would not endure this desert for a minute. It is nothing like romantic and Syrian enough for them, nothing like enough of a stage desert. Here as well there are plenty of asses, but at this point the resemblance ceases. But a desert nowadays is something like this, perhaps a deliberate obscurity a getting out of the way of oneself, a fear of noise, admiration, papers, influence, a little office, a daily task, something that hides rather than brings to light, something associating with harmless, cheerful beasts and fowl, the sight of which refreshes, a mountain for company, but not a dead one, one with eyes, that is with lakes, in certain cases even a room in a crowded hotel where one can reckon on not being recognized and on being able to talk with impunity to everyone. Here is the desert. Oh, it is lonely enough, believe me. I grant that when Heraclitus retreated to the courts and cloisters of the colossal temple of Artemis, that wilderness was worthier. Why do we lack such temples? Perchance we do not lack them. I just think of my splendid study in the Piazza di San Marco, in spring, of course, and in the morning between ten and twelve. But that which Heraclitus shunned is still just what we too avoid nowadays. The noise and democratic babble of the Ephesians, their politics, their news from the empire, I mean, of course, Persia, their market trade and the things of today. For there is one thing from which we philosophers especially need a rest, from the things of today. We honor the silent, the cold, the noble, the far, the past, everything, in fact, at the sight of which the soul is not bound to brace itself up and defend itself, something with which one can speak without speaking aloud. Just listen now to the tone of a spirit when it speaks. Every spirit has its own tone and loves its own tone. That thing yonder, for instance, is bound to be an agitator, that is, a hollow head, a hollow mug, 
whatever may go into them everything comes back from him dull and thick heavy with the echo of a great void that spirit yonder nearly always speaks hoarse has he perchance thought himself hoarse and maybe so ask the physiologists but he who thinks in words thinks as a speaker and not as a thinker it shows that he does not think of objects or think objectively but only of his relations with objects that in point of fact he only thinks of himself and his audience this third one it speaks aggressively he comes too near our body his breath blows on us we shut our mouth involuntarily although he speaks to us through a book the tone of his style supplies the reason he has no time he has small faith in himself he finds expression now or never but a spirit who is sure of himself speaks softly he seeks secrecy he lets himself be awaited a philosopher is recognized by the fact that he shuns three brilliant and noisy things fame princes and women which is not to say that they do not come to him he shuns every glaring light therefore he shuns his time and its daylight therein he is as a shadow the deeper sinks the sun the greater grows the shadow as for his humility he endures as he endures darkness a certain dependence and obscurity further he is afraid of the shock of lightning he shudders at the insecurity of a tree which is too isolated and too exposed on which every storm vents its temper every temper its storm his maternal instincts his secret love for that which grows in him guides him into states where he is relieved from the necessity of taking care of himself in the same way in which the mother instinct in woman has thoroughly maintained up to the present woman's dependent position after all they demand little enough do these philosophers their favorite motto is he who possesses is possessed all this is not as i must say again and again to be attributed to a virtue to a meritorious wish for moderation and simplicity but because their supreme lord so demands of them demands wisely and inexorably their lord who is eager only for one thing for which alone he musters and for which alone he hoards everything time strength love interest this kind of man likes not to be disturbed by enmity he likes not to be disturbed by friendship it is a type which forgets or despises easily it strikes him as bad form to play the martyr to suffer for truth he leaves all that to the ambitious and to the stage heroes of the intellect and to all those in fact who have time enough for such luxuries they themselves the philosophers have something to do for truth they make a sparing use of big words they are said to be adverse to the word truth itself it has a certain highfalutin ring finally as far as the chastity of philosophers is concerned the fruitfulness of this type of mind is manifestly in another sphere than that of children perchance in some other sphere too they have the survival of their name their literal immortality philosophers in ancient india would express themselves with still greater boldness of what use is posterity to him whose soul is the world in this attitude there is not a trace of chastity by reason of any ascetic scruple or hatred of the flesh any more than it is chastity for an athlete or a jockey to abstain from women it is rather the will of the dominant instinct at any rate during the period of their advanced philosophic pregnancy every artist knows the harm done by sexual intercourse on occasions of great mental strain and preparation as far as the strongest artists and those with the surest instincts are concerned this is not necessarily a case of experience hard experience but it is simply their maternal instinct which in order to benefit the growing work disposes recklessly but beyond all its normal stocks and supplies of the vigor of its animal life the greater power then absorbs the lesser let us now apply this interpretation to gauge correctly the case of schopenhauer which we have already mentioned in his case the sight of the beautiful acted manifestly like a resolving irritant on the chief power of his nature the power of contemplation and of intense penetration so that this strength exploded and became suddenly master of his consciousness but this by no means excludes the possibility of that particular sweetness and fullness which is peculiar to the aesthetic state springing directly from the ingredient of sensuality just as that idealism which is peculiar to girls at puberty originates in the same source it may be consequently that sensuality is not removed by the approach of the aesthetic state as schopenhauer believed 
but merely becomes transfigured and ceases to enter into the consciousness as sexual excitement. I shall return once again to this point in connection with a more delicate problem of the physiology of the aesthetic, a subject which up to the present has been singularly untouched and unelucidated. 9. A certain asceticism, a grimly gay, wholehearted renunciation, is, as we have seen, one of the most favorable conditions for the highest intellectualism, and consequently for the most natural corollaries of such intellectualism. We shall therefore be proof against any surprise that the philosophers in particular are always treating the ascetic ideal with a certain amount of predilection. A serious historical investigation shows the bond between the ascetic ideal and philosophy to be still much tighter and still much stronger. It may be said that it was only in the leading strings of this ideal that philosophy really learnt to make its first steps and baby paces. Alas, how clumsily, alas, how crossly, alas, how ready to tumble down and lie on its stomach was this shy little darling of a brat with its bandy legs. The early history of philosophy is like that of all good things. For a long time they had not the courage to be themselves. They kept always looking round to see if no one would come to their help. Further, they were all afraid of all those who looked at them. Just enumerate in order the particular tendencies and virtues of the philosopher. His tendency to doubt, his tendency to deny, his tendency to wait, to be effectic, his tendency to analyze, search, explore, dare, his tendency to compare and to equalize, his will to be neutral and objective, his will for everything which is sine era et studio. Has it yet been realized that for quite a lengthy period these tendencies went counter to the first claims of morality and conscience? To say nothing at all of reason, which even Luther chose to call Frau Kluglin, the sly whore, has it been yet appreciated that a philosopher, in the event of his arriving at self-consciousness, must needs feel himself an incarnate nitimor in ventitium, and consequently guard himself against his own sensations, against self-consciousness. It is, I repeat, just the same with all good things, on which we now pride ourselves, even judged by the standard of the ancient Greeks, our whole modern life, in so far as it is not weakness, but power and the consciousness of power, appears pure hubris and godlessness. For the things which are the very reverse of those which we honor today have had for a long time conscience on their side and God as their guardian. Hubris is our whole attitude to nature nowadays, our violation of nature with the help of machinery, and all the unscrupulous ingenuity of our scientists and engineers. Hubris is our attitude to God, that is to some alleged teleological and ethical spider behind the meshes of the great trap of the causal web. Like Charles the Bold in his war with Louis XI, we may say, Je combat l'universel arrané. Hubris is our attitude to ourselves, for we experiment with ourselves in a way that we would not allow with any animal, and with pleasure and curiosity open our soul and our living body. What matters now to us the salvation of the soul? We heal ourselves afterwards. Being ill is instructive, we doubt it not. Even more instructive than being well, inoculators of disease seem to us today even more necessary than any medicine men and saviors. There is no doubt we do violence to ourselves nowadays, we crackers of the soul's kernel, we incarnate riddles, who are ever asking riddles, as though life were naught else than the cracking of a nut, and even thereby must we necessarily become day by day more and more worthy to be asked questions and worthy to ask them, even thereby do we perchance also become worthy to live? All good things were once bad things. From every original sin has grown an original virtue. Marriage, for example, seemed for a long time a sin against the rights of the community. A man formerly paid a fine for the insolence of claiming one woman to himself. To this phrase belongs, for instance, the jus prime noctis, today still in Cambodia the privilege of the priest, that guardian of the good old customs. The soft, benevolent, yielding, sympathetic feelings, eventually valued so highly that they almost became intrinsic values, were for a long time actually despised by their possessors. Gentleness was then a subject for shame, just as hardness is now. 
compare Beyond Good and Evil aphorism 260. The submission to law, oh, with what qualms of conscience was it that the noble races throughout the world renounced the vendetta and gave the law power over themselves? Law was long a vetitium, a blasphemy, an innovation. It was introduced with force like a force, to which man only submitted with a sense of personal shame. Every tiny step forward in the world was formally made at the cost of mental and physical torture. Nowadays the whole of this point of view, that not only stepping forward, nay stepping at all, movement, change, all needed their countless martyrs, rings in our ears quite strangely. I have put it forward in the dawn of day, aphorism 18. Nothing is purchased more dearly, says the same book a little later, than the modicum of human reason and freedom which is now our pride. But then our pride is the reason why it is now almost impossible for us to feel in sympathy with those immense periods of the morality of custom, which lie at the beginning of the world's history, constituting as they do the real decisive historical principle, which has fixed the character of humanity. Those periods, I repeat, when throughout the world suffering passed for virtue, cruelty for virtue, deceit for virtue, revenge for virtue, repudiation of the reason for virtue, and when conversely well-being passed current for danger, the desire for knowledge for danger, pity for danger, peace for danger, being pitied for shame, work for shame, madness for divinity, and change for immorality and incarnate corruption. 10. There is in the same book, Aphorism 12, an explanation of the burden of unpopularity under which the earliest race of contemplative men had to live, despised almost as widely as they were first feared. Contemplation first appeared on earth in a disguised shape, in an ambiguous form, with an evil heart and often with an uneasy head. There is no doubt about it. The inactive, brooding, unwarlike element in the instincts of contemplative men long invested them with a cloud of suspicion. The only way to combat this was to excite a definite fear. And the old Brahmins, for example, knew to a nicety how to do this. The oldest philosophers were well versed in giving to their very existence and appearance meaning, firmness, background, by reason whereof men learnt to fear them. Considered more precisely, they did this from an even more fundamental need, the need for of inspiring in themselves fear and self-reverence. For they found even in their own souls all the valuations turned against themselves. They had to fight down every kind of suspicion and antagonism against the philosophical element in themselves. Being men of a terrible age, they did this with terrible means, cruelty to themselves, ingenious self-mortification. This was the chief method of the ambitious hermits and intellectual revolutionaries, who were obliged to force down the gods and the traditions of their own soul, so as to enable themselves to believe in their own revolution. I remember the famous story of the king Vikvamitra, who as the result of a thousand years of self-martyrdom reached such a consciousness of power and such confidence in himself that he undertook to build a new heaven the sinister symbol of the oldest and newest history of philosophy in the whole world. Everyone who has ever built anywhere a new heaven first found the power thereto in his own hell. Let us compress the facts into a short formula. The philosophic spirit had, in order to be possible to any extent at all, to masquerade and disguise itself as one of the previously fixed types of the contemplative men, to disguise itself as priest, wizard, soothsayer, as religious man generally, the ascetic ideal has for a long time served the philosopher as a superficial form, as a condition which enabled him to exist. To be able to be a philosopher he had to exemplify the ideal, to exemplify it he was bound to believe in it, the peculiarly etherealized abstraction of philosophers, with their negation of the world, their enmity to life, their disbelief in the senses, which has been maintained up to the present time, and has almost thereby come to be accepted as the ideal philosophic attitude. This abstraction is the result of those enforced conditions under which philosophy came into existence, and continue to exist, inasmuch as for quite a very long time philosophy would have been absolutely impossible in the world without an ascetic cloak and dress, without an ascetic self-misunderstanding. 
Expressed plainly and palpably, the ascetic priest has taken the repulsive and sinister form of the caterpillar, beneath which and behind which alone philosophy could live and slink about. Has all that really changed? Has that flamboyant and dangerous winged creature, that spirit, which that caterpillar concealed within itself, has it, I say, thanks to the sunnier, warmer, lighter world, really and finally flung off its hood and escaped into the light? Can we today point to enough pride, enough daring, enough courage, enough self-confidence, enough mental will, enough will for responsibility, enough freedom of the will to enable the philosopher to be now in the world really possible? 11. And now, after we have caught sight of the ascetic priest, let us tackle our problem. What is the meaning of the ascetic ideal? And now first becomes serious, vitally serious. We are now confronted with the real representatives of the serious. What is the meaning of all seriousness? This even more radical question is perchance already on the tip of our tongue, a question fairly for physiologists, but which we for the time being skip. In that ideal the ascetic priest finds not only his faith, but also his will, his power, his interest. His right to existence stands and falls with that ideal. What wonder that we have here run up against a terrible opponent, on the supposition, of course, that we are the opponents of that ideal, an opponent fighting for his life against those who repudiate that ideal. On the other hand, it is from the outset improbable that such a biased attitude toward our problem will do him any particular good. The ascetic priest himself will scarcely prove the happiest champion of his own ideal, on the same principle on which a woman usually fails when she wishes to champion woman let alone providing the most objective critic and judge of the controversy now raised. We shall therefore, so much as already obvious, rather have actually to help him to defend himself properly against ourselves than we shall have the fear being too well beaten by him. The idea which is the subject of this dispute is the value of our life from the standpoint of the ascetic priests. This life then, together with a whole of which it is part, nature, the world, the whole sphere of becoming and passing away, is placed by them in relation to an existence of quite another character, which it excludes and to which it is opposed, unless it deny its own self. In this case, the case of an ascetic life, life is taken as a bridge to another existence. The ascetic treats life as a maze in which one must walk backwards till one comes to the place where it starts, or he treats it as an error which one may, nay must, refute by action, for he demands that he should be followed. He enforces where he can his valuation of existence. What does this mean? Such a monstrous valuation is not an exceptional case, or a curiosity recorded in human history. It was one of the most general and persistent facts that there are. The reading from the vantage of a distant star and of the capital letters of our earthly life would perchance lead to the conclusion that the earth was the especially ascetic planet, a den of discontented, arrogant, and repulsive creatures who never got rid of a deep disgust of themselves, of the world, of all life, and did themselves as much hurt as possible out of the pleasure in hurting, presumably their one and only pleasure. Let us consider how regularly, how universally, how practically, at every single period, the ascetic priest puts in his appearance. He belongs to no particular race. He thrives everywhere. He grows out of all classes. Not that he perhaps bred this valuation by heredity and propagated it. The contrary is the case. It must be a necessity of the first order which makes this species hostile, as it is to life. Always grow again and always thrive again. Life itself must certainly have an interest in the continuance of such a type of self-contradiction. For an ascetic life is a self-contradiction. Here rules resentment without parallel, the resentment of an insatiate instinct and ambition that would be master, not over some element in life, but over life itself, over life's deepest, strongest, innermost conditions. Here is an attempt made to utilize power to damn the sources of power, here does the green eye of jealousy turn even against physiological well-being, especially against the expression of such well-being, beauty, joy, while a sense of pleasure is experienced and sought in abortion, in decay, in pain, in misfortune, in ugliness, in voluntary punishment, in the exercising flagellation and sacrifice of the self, 
all this is in the highest degree paradoxical. We are here confronted with a rift that wills itself to be a rift, which enjoys itself in the very suffering, and even becomes more and more certain of itself, more and more triumphant in proportion as its own presupposition, physiological vitality decreases. The triumph just is the supreme agony. Under this extravagant emblem did the ascetic ideal fight from of old. In this mystery of seduction, in this picture of rapture and torture, it recognized its brightest light, its salvation, its final victory. Crux, nux, lux, it has all these three in one. End of section five.